In 2001, a few days after 9-11, President Bush addressed Congress and the nation. Uh, and he um, asks, asked a series of questions in his address and proposed answers to these questions. One of the questions he asked was, why do they hate us? Americans are asking, why do they hate us? And his answer, which is on that slide, basically boils down to they, meaning Al-Qaeda and its sympathizers, hate us because they hate freedom and democracy. Uh, now, although Bush asked a good question, his answer strikes me as um, somewhat preposterous. I mean, uh, freedom and democracy were very low down on uh, Al-Qaeda's list of concerns. Uh, Al-Qaeda was uh, clearly primarily exercised by the presence of American troops in Saudi Arabia around the time of the first Gulf War and by the influence of the United States, its political influence, uh, on, on the Middle East. That's what bin Laden was really objecting to. Um, and, and Bush and the intelligence community in the United States were in a position to know this because bin Laden had said this many times. So if they didn't know this, then this was a case of willful ignorance. They were in a position to know uh, what Al-Qaeda's objectives and motives and grievances were. Uh, and this is not a good characterization of them. Okay, so... Uh, So this has led some uh, terrorism scholars to say that there's a kind of more general problem here with counterterrorism, uh, which is that they don't really listen hard enough or carefully enough to what terrorists themselves tell us about their motives, their grievances, their objectives, and their tactics. Okay, so this accusation is made most famously by Richard Jackson, famous terrorism scholar, uh, where he says, with only a handful of notable exceptions, little effort has been made by terrorism experts and officials to try to understand terrorist motivations by listening to their own words and messages and seriously engaging with their subjectivity. So that's Jackson's accusation, and that is the essence of what he calls the epistemological crisis of counterterrorism. Now, it seems to me that, that, that uh, Jackson isn't being entirely fair here. I mean, it's certainly true that, that in the Bush speech, uh, he doesn't really seriously engage with the motivations of the 9-11 attackers. Uh, but of course, the Bush speech was, speech was simply a piece of political rhetoric. It wasn't a serious piece of, of, of analysis. Uh, and I'd be willing to take a bet that the American intelligence community was a very close and careful student of every single thing that bin Laden said. Right? I mean, of course, they had a huge interest in, 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 in trying to find out what, uh, what bin Laden's objectives were, what his motives were, and what his tactics were likely to be. Indeed, um, as, as some of you will know, uh, CIA headquarters in Langley actually had a bin Laden issue station for, for many years. The one and only example of an issue station at Langley, which is devoted not to a country or a region, but to an individual. Okay. So uh, um, it doesn't seem right to suppose that counter-terrorists, um, people in the intelligence community, in the military and so on, it doesn't seem right to suppose that they were not seriously, seriously interested in listening to the words and messages of terrorist actors. And indeed, it seems to me that, 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 that Jackson is in himself guilty of the very thing that he accuses other people of being guilty of, which is not actually engaging seriously with the subjectivity and the words and uh, working practices of counter-terrorists. Right? So he accuses counter-terrorists of not, not really listening, of not seriously studying what terrorists are up to. But I think the Jackson quote uh, strongly suggests to me a failure to really listen to or engage with or try to understand what counter-terrorists do. I mean, of course counter-terrorists are in the business of countering terrorism. Right? And that means that of course they spend a lot of their time trying to work out what terrorists think because they realize the practical importance of this. But maybe Jackson's making a more subtle point. So if you go back to the, to the, to the, uh, the, the quotation that was on an earlier slide, Jackson says there's a failure to listen to the words and messages of terrorists and to engage with their subjectivity. 
Okay, so one question is what, is, what does he mean by engage with their subjectivity? When you listen to the words and messages of terrorists, does that mean you are thereby engaging with their subjectivity? Right? Or is engaging with the subjectivity of terrorists something that's additional to simply listening to their words and messages? So maybe the Jackson thought is something like this. If you want a deep understanding of terrorists, it's not enough simply to read their messages, to read their public pronouncements. That isn't going to be sufficient to give you what I'm just calling a deep understanding. For a deep understanding, we need to, as you might say, understand terrorism and terrorists from within. In other words, somehow to understand them not third personally, but first personally. Okay, so maybe that's what Jackson is saying. Maybe he's saying the problem with counter-terrorists is that of course, they, of course they, you know, they, 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 you know, they listened to bin Laden's messages, but they didn't really try to see the world through his eyes. Right? And that was the sense in which they failed to engage with his subjectivity. Okay, so that now starts to look like a plea for something called Feshtayan. Okay, so maybe, although Jackson doesn't use this terminology, maybe what he's really suggesting is that for a deep understanding of terrorism and terrorists, what we need is this thing called Verstehen. Okay, so Verstehen uh, is standardly defined in the following way. It consists in the attempt to understand social phenomena from within, that is, from the point of view of the social agent. And Verstehenism is a, is a, is a kind of well-known position in philosophy uh, that's been de developed and exemplified by a, a number of the great dead um, philosophers. Okay, so maybe the thought is something like this. If you really want to understand terrorism, if you want a deep understanding of terrorism, you need to not just listen to terrorists, but to engage seriously with their subjectivity. And to do that, you need Feshtayen. Okay, so that's the, that's, that's the story that's emerging. Now, none of this is explicit in Jackson, and I don't think he's thinking in these terms at all, but I'm trying to offer a sort of charitable reading of his, of his point, a reading on which he does, what he's saying isn't just straightforwardly false. Okay, so, supposing that's the proposal. If that is the proposal, then I think there are three fundamental questions that we need to address. Question one, is it actually possible to achieve Verstehen of terrorists. Right? And, and maybe the answer to that is, well, it depends on which terrorists you're talking about, right? I mean, maybe it's easier to achieve it with some terrorists than with others, right? And that seems to me to be plainly true, right? And, and then that leads to the further question of, well, which terrorists can we understand in this way? And which terrorists can we not understand or easily understand in this way? So that's, so these are all questions about the possibility of Fischtein. The second question is really about the necessity of Feshtay, not whether it's possible, but whether it's necessary. Okay, and that, that's really the question that's being raised by both the second and the third bullet point on that slide. Okay, so, so the, the Jackson point is that we really need to do this, right? We really need to exercise Feshtay in order to have a deep understanding of terrorism and terrorists, right? So somebody might want to know why that's, why that's true, right? I mean, why isn't it enough just to listen to their words and messages, to study them from a kind of external point of view, right? Why isn't it enough to, to arrive at what you might call a, a sociological or a psychological understanding of terrorists? Why do we need to do this, this special thing called Verstehen, which is um, looking at the world from their point of view, whatever that turns out to be? Okay, so, so those are the questions, right? Those are the questions that we, need to, that we need to address. Now, I am going to address these three questions, right? And these, these are the framing questions of this, of this talk. But before getting down to business, right, there's a prior issue that needs to be addressed, which is, of course, I need to say much more about what Verstehen is, right? I've given you a very rough characterization of Verstehen, um, but what is it actually, and how do you do it? If you want to exercise this special capacity, how do you develop it? Okay, so here's an idea which I think is, 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 is a highly intuitive idea about the nature of Verstehen. The idea is that to exercise Verstehen, you need empathy. Right, so empathy is the key 
to this special kind of understanding. Okay, so if, if, if you talk about listening, well, listening is good, you know, listening is good, right? But listening is only going to qualify as a source of Verstehen if it's, as people say, empathetic listening. Okay, so what's empathy then? That's the next question. What is that? Now, those of you who study this know that there are just hundreds, if not thousands, of books and articles on the topic of empathy. Right? Uh, and I'm not going to try and give you a survey of what different people think about empathy. I'm just going to work with one particular conception of empathy, which I think is a very useful conception, um, and that, that brings into focus many of the questions that I'm interested in. So it's a view of empathy defended by and elaborated by Olivia Bailey in a series of papers. So Olivia Bailey, I think, is uh, now at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, and she published a, a series of papers um, on, uh, on, em on empathy. And her basic idea is summarized on this slide. Okay, so it involves using one's imagination to transport oneself such that one considers the other's situation as though one were occupying their position. And then she goes on to say that empathy isn't a cool intellectual enterprise. Um, rather, the emotional experience of the one who empathizes closely resembles the emotional experience of the target of empathy. Okay, so what's going on here? Okay, so I think an example would help. Um, so this is her example. Okay, so imagine um, that a friend of yours has just lost their spouse. Right? Their spouse has just died. Right? Uh, and they are upset. Uh, they're experiencing tremendous grief at the loss of their spouse. Okay, so what do you do when you empathize in this sense with your friend? Okay, so the first thing to notice is that what Bailey is talking about is empathizing with your friend's emotions. Okay, so, that, so, so, so it's, not, it, it's knowledge or understanding of someone else's emotions that empathy gives you. Okay, so, so here's how you might, um, uh, you might do it. Okay, you recreate, you recreate in your imagination your friend's situation. Right, so you recreate imaginatively the experience of losing a loved one who may be a spouse. Okay, so, so, so there's an imaginative exercise here. Right? Okay, but, and this is the crucial point, when you do that, you produce in yourself emotions that resemble the emotions of the person you're empathizing with. Right, so it's not just that when you empathize with your friend's grief, you have a kind of a purely intellectual apprehension of their grief. Rather, you produce in yourself something like the emotion of grief. So the way that, 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 that Bailey puts it is to say that um, um, when we imagine losing a loved one, we encounter our imaginative recreation through the same or similar emotional lens as the lens through which your friend encounters, um, um, encounters their loss. Okay, so here's another striking quotation from Bailey. When we empathize, we do not merely imagine that we are feeling some emotion, rather we actually experience an emotion. Okay, so, so, I mean, just think about it, right? If you imagine a close friend who's lost a loved one, I mean, you don't just have a purely cool intellectual apprehension of their situation. When you think about what it would be like to lose a loved one, and when you really imagine that, right, and you start to think about, my God, what would it be like to lose my child, or to lose my spouse, or to lose a parent, or to lose a sibling, right, that produces, produces in you a kind of tightness, right, uh, um, a, a, a feeling that is not exactly the same, of course, as the feeling of the person you're empathizing with, but a feeling that has some features in common, some emotional characteristics in common. Okay, so that last quotation, when we empathize, we do not merely imagine that we are feeling some emotion, rather, we actually experience an emotion. Okay, that's why this is called emotional empathy. 
right? It's emotional in two senses, right? It's emotional in the sense that the target is an emotion. You're trying to empathize with someone else's emotion, but it's also emotional in the sense that, in the sense that um, empathizing with that other person's emotion produces in you an, an emotion as well. Right? It's an emotion that has features in common with the person you are empathizing with. Okay, so that is, um, that is Bailey's theory of, um, of, of, of empathy. There's one other element of her theory which I want to highlight. The other element is this. When you empathize with your friend's grief, right, you don't empathize with their grief, you don't encounter their grief as something strange or inappropriate or hard to understand. Right? You experience their grief in your imagination or you encounter their grief in their imagination as an appropriate reaction to their situation, an appropriate and indeed intelligible reaction to their situation. Okay? So their grief is not just an emotion that they have. Their grief is an emotion that you um, understand. It makes sense to you that they feel the way that they feel. Okay, so this is the core of what Bailey calls humane understanding. Humane understanding consists in the direct apprehension of the intelligibility of others' emotions. Okay, so you are aware of the intelligibility of your friend's emotions. Okay, that's, so that's her view. Okay, now of course you might have other information which makes you think that actually their, their grief on, on reflection isn't appropriate. I mean, maybe you know that they know that their partner cheated on them throughout their marriage and abused them, right? And then you might think, well, why are they feeling grief, right? But at least, at least to begin with, absent other considerations of that sort, their grief is intelligible to you. And it's intelligible to you because it's an appropriate reaction to their situation. Okay, so that's the theory of empathy. Now, um, the question I want to ask now is whether it's possible to empathize in that way with terrorists, okay, and whether empathizing in that way with terrorists is actually essential right, for the purposes that Jackson describes. Okay, now I said earlier on that, well, I mean, it depends on the terrorists you're talking about, right? I mean, maybe it's easier to do it in some cases than in other cases. Okay, so I want to give you a, a an example, uh, and I want to, I'd quite like us to just think about this pra practical example. Okay, so there's a, so how do I do this? There's a video clip that I need to play. Um. I'm not sure 
All right. So I hope I hope that the um, the message, the relevance of that video, is 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 clear. Right. I mean, the challenge in that case with that individual the question is this: right? Is it actually possible to empathise with that man's emotions? Okay. So, well, what were his emotions? Right. Well, if you if you take, I mean, if you listen carefully, so one emotion that I think comes through is glee. Right. He was evidently gleeful about what he'd just done, and he'd be proud of what he'd just done. Now, of course, I mean, I can understand in the abstract right, that he was indeed proud and gleeful about his actions. Okay, but if, if I'm asked to do what Bailey is, thinks of as empathy, right, that, I find that an incredibly difficult thing to do. Right? I can't transport myself into his position see the world from his point of view. And in particular, I cannot produce in myself anything like glee and pride as a reaction to mass murder. Right? I just can't do it. Okay, so, so it's not just that I can't do it, but that even if I were able to do it, I wouldn't be able to apprehend his emotions as Appropriate, right? You think about the the, the Bailey view about the the, the, the grief-stricken friend is that you 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 experience you you experience not just their grief or a version of their grief, but also that it's that it's appropriate. In this case, even if I could somehow manufacture in myself something like feelings of gleefulness in response to mass murder, I certainly couldn't produce in myself the sense that this is the right thing for a person to feel. Okay, so, so, so it looks as though what we have here is actually a lack of intelligibility. In a certain sense, this individual is very, I, I mean, I'm just talking about myself, maybe you're different here, but to me, this individual is in, is, is, is in some sense very opaque. Right? Now, that is not to say that I cannot in any, in any sense understand his actions. Right? That, that, isn't, that, is, that is not what I'm saying. Right? I, I mean, of course I can understand his actions uh, in, in other ways, right? So I can think about, uh, you know, perhaps his actions as a product of radicalization. I can think of his actions as a product of a certain kind of brutalization. I can think of his actions as a response to uh, his views about Israel and so on, right? Of course, I can, I can think all of those thoughts, but what I can't do is to enter imaginatively into his inner world, right? His inner world is profoundly inaccessible to me and it's inaccessible to me both for, more, for, for psychological reasons and for moral reasons. Right? My, when I say psychological, what I mean is my, my emotional sensibility prevents me from really seriously occupying his perspective, right? given, you know, given what you just heard. Right? And, and I think there's also a kind of moral obstacle here. Um, okay, so this is Adam Morton in a very good paper called Empathy for the Devil, where he says, that, that empathy requires at least a certain kind of sympathetic identification with the person you're empathizing with. Okay, so when your friend has experienced a, a, a great personal loss, um, you sympathetically identify with them. But that sympathetic identification isn't possible in this, uh, in this case. Okay, so, so, so I think there are questions about the, uh, possi even the possibility of empathy in this sense of empathy. Okay, what about the necessity of empathy? Well, it's not clear why, again, why empathy is necessary. Right? I mean, of course I can make sense in a certain way of this person's actions right? um, uh, by, by thinking about the social context in which he was brought up, the kind of education he may have had, uh, the organization that he belonged to. Right? I, I mean, there are lots of, as it were, external um, observations I can make about this individual, which in some sense explain his actions. 
Um, I, can, I can reconstruct what you might call the ballistics of his thoughts and feelings. Right? But reconstructing the ballistics of his, of his thoughts and feelings is not at all a matter of somehow feeling those feelings. Right? I, don't need to do I don't need to do that. Why do I need to do that? Right? That's my question. Isn't that just completely redundant from an explanatory point of view? Okay, now, of course, this guy is a, I mean, he's a, a foot soldier, right? Uh, on, on, he was a, a foot soldier on October the 7th, but the same point applies to the leadership of Hamas. I mean, can I occupy the, it, the, the internal perspective of the people who ordered this attack? Again, I can't really do that. I mean, I can understand why they did it, because I've read, the, I've read the Hamas charter, right? And I understand this attack is sort of flowing from that. But I can't, I can't occupy their standpoint in, the, in this rich Bailey sense. Okay, so what I'm saying is that, is that although it's very attractive and appealing to say that we need this kind of engagement with subjectivity, in at least some cases, not all cases of terrorism, but at least in some cases of terrorism, uh, cases of what, what are sometimes called horrorism, right? it's terrorism that involves mass murder and mutilation and rape. Right? In, those cases, in those cases, I want to say that this engagement with the terrorist actor's subjectivity is neither possible nor necessary. They're my two claims, neither possible nor necessary. Right? Okay, so, um, now, there's another, there's another view um, that is, is around in the literature, which is the very opposite of the Jackson view. Okay? And this is the view of Alan Dershowitz in a book called Why Terrorism Works. Now, Dershowitz does the, does the, does the, the, the full 180-degree turn on Jackson. Right? Jackson says we should, we should listen to the terrorist messages and, and engage with their subjectivity. Dershowitz says, our message to terrorists must be this. Even if you have legitimate grievances, if you resort to terrorism, we will simply not listen to you. We will tr not try to understand you, and we will never change any of our policies toward you. Instead, we will hunt you down and destroy your capacity to engage in terror. Okay, now that doesn't seem right either. Right? That doesn't seem right either. I mean, after all, if, you, if you're really serious about countering terrorism, you actually better make an effort to understand, what, to understand why they do what they do. You do need to understand their grievances. Okay, so we, we need to find a, a middle way between, between this sort of policy of willful ignorance, which Dershowitz is recommending on the one hand, and the, and the sort of extreme what I would call rather extreme demands for emotional empathy on the other hand. So we need, we need, uh, we need an understanding of terrorism that avoids these two, these two extremes. Okay, so what's my, what's my, um, what's my suggestion? Okay, so, so here's a thought, right? So, so first of all, so far in the discussion, I've talked a lot about um, understanding that another person's emotions. Okay, but when it comes to understanding terrorist actors, it's not really emotions that we're primarily interested in. Right? What we're really interested in are, as I would see, their motives, their objectives, their grievances, and their tactics. Right? That's what, that, that, that should be what we're mainly concerned with. Right? So, if anybody wants to say, well, we need, we need this sort of emotional empathy to understand that, right? it's not really clear what emotional empathy has to do with these things. I mean, emotional empathy, as Bailey sees it, is all about understanding another person's emotions. But if you're interested in understanding another person's um, objectives, for example, it's not so clear that emotional empathy is going to be the right, the right tool anyway. Right? I mean, maybe emotional empathy is somehow relevant to understanding another person's grievances, because maybe grievances have something to do with a person's emotional response to their situation. Okay, but, but, it, but it, doesn't look, it doesn't look as if it, um, empathy is really what we're after in these cases. So what do we need in these cases? Okay, so I think there are, th there are three things that I, want, that I want to emphasize, and these are three things that I want to emphasize particularly in the light of both 9-11 and October the 7th. I think both those incidents really show the importance of these three things. Okay, the first thing is, of course, the importance of careful reading and listening. Right? That, that is to say, you need to listen very carefully right, to what, um, what terrorists tell you 
about their grievances, their objectives, and their tactics. Um, that's the first thing. You need to be willing to take terrorists at their word. Right? So if terrorists tell you that they're going to do a certain thing, or they're planning to do a certain thing, it's generally a good idea to assume that that is indeed what they're planning to do. Don't, don't operate on the basis of, oh, they don't really mean it. Right? Because sometimes they do really mean it. Right? So that's the second thing that's very important. Okay. And of course you need to, in, in some sense, um, have, uh, uh, exercise empathy, but the empathy that's relevant here is not emotional empathy, but cognitive empathy. That's to say, a kind of much cooler form of mind reading. Right? Um, okay, so, so that they're the three things that I, I, I think are, are, are necessary. Um, so this, this other kind of empathy which I'm talking about is sometimes called strategic empathy. Uh, and if anyone wants to ask about that in the discussion, I'm happy to say more about strategic empathy. But the important point about strategic empathy is that it's, it's still trying to understand somebody from the outside. Right? It's not about trying to um, uh, engage with them emotionally in the way that people like Bailey are, um, are discussing. So, so, so I want to end with um, this Jackson idea of the uh, emotional, uh, of, sorry, of the epistemological crisis of counterterrorism. Okay, so Jackson starts off by saying the epistemological crisis of counterterrorism is a refusal or unwillingness to listen to the words and messages of terrorists and an unwillingness to engage with their subjectivity. Right, so for the reasons I've given, I don't see those as really the amounting to an epistemological crisis of, of counterterrorism, right? Um, I think counter-terrorists do listen to the words and messages of terrorist groups and terrorist individuals. They don't engage in emotional empathy, but there's no need to do that, as I, as I see it. I think the real uh, um, epistemological crisis of counter-terrorism is really a combination of naivety and wishful thinking. Um, naivety is, 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 is naively believing that people don't mean what they say. Right? I mean, um, of course, terrorists may make all sorts of exaggerated threats which they're not capable of carrying out, but the default assumption should be that they do mean what they say. Right? Um, and wishful thinking, again, is, is you know, it, it, it's, it's sort of wishing that they're not serious or that they don't have the means to do what they say they're going to do. Uh, and, and a very good example of this was, is, is actually October the 7th. Now, this is a classic illustration of the problem. Okay, so if, if you've been following the, uh, uh, the, the, the press on this, it seems as though, it seems as though um, Israeli intelligence had um, uh, access to Hamas's plans for October the 7th at least a year before the attack. Right? Hamas, in, in, its, in its battle plan, described in very great detail what, was, what it was going to do on October the 7th and how it was going to do it. Okay, so what did, what did the Israelis do with this? Well, the, the assumption in Israeli military intelligence, well, they made two assumptions, right? The first assumption was that they, don't, they didn't really mean it, right? I mean, that this was, this, this, this was, a, this was really aspirational, right? That, this, that, that what, was, what, what was being described here were Hamas's aspirations, not a serious plan for action. And the second thing, the second assumption that Israeli intelligence made was that Hamas, in any case, didn't have the capacity to carry out an attack on these, on this, of this sort. Right? That's what I mean by a combination of naivety and wishful thinking. Um, and of course, when in the days before October the 7th, um, Israeli troops on the border with Gaza was, were, were, were sending back reports of an imminent attack, Right. Those reports were again dismissed, right. uh, and it, it's it's, it, this is a very interesting point that the reports on, of, of an impending attack were coming from unarmed junior female Israeli soldiers on the border, right? And what, one hypothesis that's being considered is that is that actually if those reports had come from more senior, armed, and in particular male so soldiers, perhaps they would have been taken more seriously. I mean, maybe this is a case of testimonial injustice, right? quite, quite conceivably. 
right? But they were, but they were extremely detailed reports of, of Hamas gathering on their side of the border, about to carry out an attack, uh, along the lines described in the plans that Israeli intelligence already had. Okay. So, I don't want to go back over the history of 9-11, but again, with 9-11, until 9-11, I think there was an unwillingness to really believe that Al-Qaeda posed a threat, a serious threat to the, to, to the homeland, right? I mean, there was one CIA analyst who, um, who was writing threat reports saying that, that, that the big one was coming, right? And that uh, Al-Qaeda was about to launch a, a, a major attack on, on, on the American mainland. Again, those reports were not taken seriously. Right? Again, it was the same combination of wishful thinking and naivety. Okay, so, so, so here's, the, here's the sort of homily that I want to end with. Right? I want to say that, that at least for the purposes of counter-terrorism, I'm not here talking about other interests that you may have in terrorism, but at least for the purposes of counter-terrorism, what's really needed is not to engage with the subjectivity of terrorists, at least not in this full-blown emotional empathy sense. What's needed is, I think, three things. First of all, a heavy dose of literalism. By literalism, I mean take them at their word. Okay. That was what was missing in the idea that Hamas's battle plans were aspirational. Right. That was just a failure to take them at their word. Okay. So, that was not, so that's what I mean by literalism. Secondly, a big dose of epistemic humility. Right. So of course, there's a lot that we don't know and that we know that we don't know. Right. And that, again, it, it's essential to recognize that. And, in, and I, don't, I don't think that counter-terrorists fail on that count at all. I think they're perfectly aware that there's a lot that they don't know. And the last thing that is needed is uh, what I call strategic pessimism, right? which is that the belief that sooner or later everything is going to turn to shit. Right? And that has, in, in fact, been the case in the history of terrorism. Okay? And, and, the, and, and I think this has a big impact on which counter-terrorist strategy you employ. Right. So there are multiple counter-terrorist strategies that you can employ. So, for example, there's the uh, President Obama counter-terrorist strategy when confronted with ISIS. Right. The Obama counter-terrorist strategy uh, was, was the strategy of degrade and destroy. Right. That was Obama's strategy. And that was the basis of Operation Inherent Resolve, right, which is the operation to destroy ISIS in 2016, 2017. Right. An alternative strategy might be a strategy of containment. Or they might be a strategy of negotiation. Okay, well, which of these strategies is the appropriate counter-terrorist strategy depends on which terrorists you're dealing with. Right? It depends on what the terrorists themselves tell you about their objectives and about their red lines. Right? And when they tell you that, we are, that, that, that they're not going to settle for anything less than everything that they want, there's going to be no compromise, no possibility of compromise, in that situation, right, there's no point talking about containment or negotiation. Right? And that was basically Obama's calculation with ISIS, right? that you couldn't deal with ISIS on the basis of, well, let's see if we can, we can work out a compromise here. Right? Obama came to the conclusion that actually, in the end, the only way to deal with ISIS was through this what he'd himself described as the policy of degrade and destroy. Right? And that may indeed be the right approach in, in, uh, in some cases. Okay, so this workshop is about terrorism and subjectivity. So in a way, this is the worst possible way to start, right? Because I'm, in, in, a, way, in a way, expressing considerable skepticism about the project of engaging with the subjectivity of terrorists, at least if you understand that project in this very rich way that, that I've been describing. There may be much more modest ways of understanding that project in which it is indeed a good project. So I'll stop there. <laughs>